Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Hill, Texas history teacher for Team Michigan State at Owsley Junior High School. And today we are going to be learning about the oil industry in Texas, from the discovery of oil uh, all the way through uh, the changes that oil had on our political, economic, geographic, and social settings here in Texas. So first things first, let's talk about a couple of key terms. Uh, you'll find your key terms on your Google Notes, so your uh, C Notes, your Google Doc version of your C Notes or your printed copy that you have in class. They're going to be in the left-hand column on the side with the one mini bio that we have today. And our first key term is boomtown. Boomtown. Now, we've talked about boom and bust, and we say that when things are booming, they're going really well. When things are bust, they're not too good. So when we say boom town, what do you think we're saying? That's right, that things are going really good. And it's a town that has grown from an economic boom. So a boom town is a town undergoing rapid growth due to sudden economic prosperity, meaning people are making money and a town grows up wherever that money source is coming from. Our next key term is the word industrialization. Industrialization, industrialization is a process that transforms agricultural economies, meaning um, economies that are based on growing crops. It changes them into economies that are dominated by industry and by machine manufacturing, factories, um, and, and products being built on assembly lines and, and being assembled by people. Um, so industrialization is the moving from farming to building things. Petroleum. No doubt you've heard that word before. Petroleum. Petroleum is the substance that provides oil, gasoline, and other fuels. So um, the raw material that comes out of the ground that we refer to as oil is actually petroleum. And then that petroleum is taken and it is changed into different products such as oil, gasoline, and, and other fuels like kerosene, um, aircraft, uh, aviation fuel, uh, different things like that. Uh, it's also used, for, petroleum is also used for uh, plastics. Uh, if you didn't have petroleum, you wouldn't have plastics. Um, it is used for um, uh, things like Vaseline. Uh, skin care products and things that, uh, you know, lubricants, oil, things that we use to, uh, uh, to keep uh, moving parts going. Now, we talked about petroleum and how it is turned into these other products. Well, petroleum is turned into those products at a place called a refinery. A refinery is a facility that cleans and separates petroleum into different parts, such as gasoline, kerosene, uh, and the other, the other different products that come from petroleum. Next key term, urbanization. Now, no doubt you've heard the term urban before. We've talked about it in this class. Urban has to do with the city. The term used for the country is rural. So you have rural, which is the country, and you have urban, which is the city. So urbanization is the change in a country or region when its population begins to migrate from rural to urban. So when this change from when people move from living in the country to living in the city is called urbanization. Our mini biography today is a man named Patillo Higgins or Patio Higgins. Uh, Patio Higgins was a man who uh, uh, was in a lot of different uh, businesses uh, throughout his, his, his young life, uh, his, his young adulthood. He tried his hand in a lot of different things to make money, and he believed that there was oil at a place called Spindletop Hill, which is near Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont is down uh, along the coast of Texas. Um, very close to the border between Texas and Louisiana. And he believed that, that there was oil 
underneath the ground under a, a huge salt dome, which a salt dome is, is a, a thing that develops and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a dome made of salt. Um, and Patillo Higgins or Patillo Higgins believed that there was oil under Spindle Top Hill. Um, unfortunately, he, as he started drilling for this, they ran out of money. They needed more money. Uh, and Patio Higgins was eventually pushed out of his own company uh, by his partners before oil was struck there. But he is the one who believed that there was oil there, and he is the one that started the drilling process uh, at Spindletop Hill. We'll talk more about him in just a moment. How, our essential question today how did the discovery of oil at Spindletop affect the political, economic, and social development of Texas? How did the discovery of oil at Spindletop affect the political, economic, and social development of Texas? So let's talk a little bit about the age of oil. Uh, the age of oil is an era in Texas history that is characterized by an increased use of of petroleum in products and as fuel. Unrefined petroleum, which is the, the raw oil, that what we call oil, that is underground, has been used for various purposes since ancient times. Now, <clears throat> Texas is one of those rare places, or, or was in the past, where, where there were places in Texas where there was so much oil underneath the ground that it seeped up to the surface. Um, the same thing out in the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf of Mexico, you have these huge reserves of, of petroleum deep underwater, deep underground, and there's so much of it that it has a tendency to sometimes seep up. And when, you know, oil and water do not mix. So sometimes if you go to the coast of Texas, you'll see these things on the beach called tar balls, these little black uh, specks or little black balls uh, of, of petroleum. And as the water washes them in, because like I said, oil and water don't mix, as the water washes the petroleum in uh, this, that has leaked up and it hits the beach, it mixes with the sand and it, it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth with the motion of the water. And these tar balls have a tendency to grow. And if you've ever been to the beach and you've accidentally stepped on one, they're extremely sticky, really messy. Um, and, and for thousands of years, that petroleum washed up on the shores of Texas. And it was used by Native Americans. When the Native Americans found it on the beach, they would take it, they would, they would gather it together. They found that they could heat it up and that it would become like a liquid. And then they could, once it became a liquid, they could use it and they could rub it and smear it all over the inside of their baskets. And it made those baskets waterproof uh, once it dried. So, like I said, oil has been used for a lot of purposes, uh, even here in Texas, for, for hundreds, even thousands of years uh, by the Native Americans. Now, when the Spanish came and they found these, uh, how the Indians used these tar balls, the Indians uh, showed the Spanish what to do with it, and the Spanish would use it to, uh, to seal between the, the wood and of their ships on the inside. They would heat it up, they would smear it on there, they would apply it, uh, and as it hardened up, as it thickened up, it would it would serve as a seal and would keep water from leaking into their ships. So in the 19th century, the techniques to take that raw petroleum and to refine it into different things led to the development and the invention of the the gasoline engine and this changed oil use forever uh, here in the United States we had always used coal uh, to uh, to provide heat uh, to burn for you know whatever purposes uh, but with the the discovery of ways to change oil and to refine it into fuel that could be used, it really was a game changer and it, it changed so much in the history of, of the United States. Now, the age of oil began in 1901 with the strike at Spindletop near Beaumont, Texas. It launched large-scale oil production and wide availability of petroleum products. So, 
some characteristics of the age of oil. What makes this era in Texas history different than other eras? Well, number one, the Galveston hurricane uh, is considered to have occurred during the age of oil. Uh, in 1900, shortly before the discovery of oil at Spindletop, uh, the Galveston hurricane came in and, and destroyed um, the city of Galveston, as we learned earlier this week. Um, when the oil was discovered in early 1901, this led to a huge change, uh, and it caused the city of Houston, which is not too terribly far from Beaumont, it caused Houston to have this huge boom, and Houston grew. And as a result of Houston's growth and, and the, in the oil industry, when the shipping and, and um, trade companies were looking for a place to relocate, Houston was the logical choice. That's why today Houston is an incredibly huge populated city with an unbelievable economy, and Galveston is just a tourist spot. So another characteristic of the age of oil, the discovery of oil at Spindletop, obviously, in 1901. Also, the development of the oil industry in Texas, which we're going to talk about here shortly. So more characteristics of the age of oil. Industrialization. Once oil was discovered and this, they were able to take this petroleum and they were able to refine it and turn it into different types of fuel, it really made um, industrialization uh, become so much easier. Um, before the, the invention of the gasoline or the, the, the gasoline-powered engine, um, machinery at, um, at factories was run on steam. And it was, it was, of course, very dangerous because they had to boil it. The, 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 the water and the steam were under pressure. There were explosions. There were fires. There were all sorts of terrible things. With the invention of, of gasoline-powered engines, now machinery and factories could be run on gasoline, and it was much safer, and it was much more efficient. Also, another characteristic, the urbanization of Texas. Um, as factories began to crop up, as big cities began, or as cities began to form, people began moving from the country to the cities where there were jobs. Also, because of all of the changes that were taking place with industrialization and with the building of factories and with more and more people moving to cities, um, we had what is called progressive era, which is a time when the government really started getting involved in trying to improve the quality of life uh, for people, uh, especially people who lived in urban areas, uh, in cities, uh, where people were packed in very densely. And, uh, and then the progressive era through World War I, which we'll be talking about next week. So oil was discovered at Spindletop. On January 10th, 1901, on a hill called Spindletop near, the Bo near Beaumont and near the Louisiana border, um, Patillo Higgins and a man named Anthony Lucas had a partnership uh, that eventually led to the discovery of oil. Now, as I said, they, they, they tried to dig, they tried to, um, to, to drill and, and discover this oil that, that Higgins knew was there, believed was there. And unfortunately, they ran out of money, so uh, they had to go out and find alternative sources to help pay for the drilling that they were doing. And uh, a group of men that, that Anthony Lucas uh, found that were willing to provide that money uh, said that they would provide the money, but they wanted Higgins out of the equation, so Higgins was forced out of his own com company. Now, Anthony Lucas and the other guys became just filthy rich, and it would sound like it was a horrible thing for Patio Higgins, but um, it actually worked out because he, because of his abilities to, to figure out where oil was, he eventually did strike oil and, and became a very rich man. Uh, and, and actually, he's the one that we remember to this day more than Anthony Lucas and the other men um, as being sort of the father of the discovery of oil. So, Tons of clay, sand, and water, and eventually a towering column of black sticky oil erupted roughly 100 feet into the air, uh, twice the height of the derrick. So on the day that oil was struck, uh, 
the men who were working on the derrick, which the derrick is the uh, the wooden framework that holds the the drilling apparatus that that you've seen the the look the, the one out at Six Flags, the big red tower. That is an oil derrick, uh, not like they originally had that were made of wood, but it's a a much more uh, a modern version of one. Um, so they were digging. The ground started to rumble. Um, they felt the earth shake. They heard a loud like I said, a rumbling noise, um, and suddenly uh, dirt and sand and water started blowing out of this hole, and eventually this, like I said, a towering column of, of petroleum shot straight up in the air uh, and just drenched everything around the derrick. Um, oil had been discovered in Texas. So <clears throat> to kind of put into perspective, um, the discovery of oil and 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 what the discovery of oil at Spindle Top meant for the world. If you look at this little graph I have over here on the side, there were working oil wells in the United States uh, when oil was discovered at Spindle Top in 1901. Uh, and and in this little graph, we look at one, two, three, five. Five different places where oil was was discovered. Um, oil was discovered at a place called Drake, Pennsylvania, and the oil well at Drake, Pennsylvania, was producing about forty five barrels of oil per day. Um, in Corsicana, Texas, which is just uh, about forty miles from here, in Corsicana, Texas, men had been drilling a, a water well and had accidentally struck oil instead. And that well was thought to be a massive well at the time, and it was pumping as much as 50 barrels per day. Well, in Minningston, West Virginia, there was an oil well that was producing the uh, amazing amount of 1,600 barrels a day. And then out in Kern, California, they hit a gusher out there, and there was a a field that was producing 47,000 barrels a day. Now that sounds like just an unbelievable amount of oil compared to the 45 and 50 barrels per day that were coming out of, of these two locations. Then there was Spindle Top. At its height, Spindle Top was producing 1 million barrels of oil each day. Each day. One million barrels per day. Now, I just realized um, you probably don't know what a barrel of oil is. Well, a barrel of oil um, contains 42 gallons of oil. So, when we're talking about a million barrels of oil, we're talking about 42 million gallons of oil per day. 42 million gallons of oil coming out of one well in a single day. That is just, that was unheard of. It was astronomical. No one ever believed that there was that much oil to be discovered. So, the oil at Spindletop, the, the well at Spindletop produced more barrels of oil per day than the rest of the entire world put together. One million barrels per day. Now we're going to watch a little short video. Actually, I'm going to, um, I'll go ahead and post a link to the video. I'm a little concerned about whether or not the video is going to play for you guys. So we'll just go ahead and continue on, and then you can watch the video. It's only about a three-minute video. You can watch that later on. So <clears throat> when the first wells were, were drilled, um, they really didn't know how to drill for oil. They were just sort of winging it. And over time, um, the technology for drilling for oil in, in cre improved, and um, they were able to drill deeper, uh, they were able to drill longer, they were able to drill uh, uh, faster than they ever had before. Um, at Spindletop, what they found is when they, when they drilled the hole, because the soil was very sandy, 
If you've ever dug in sand, you know that as you dig out, uh, the sides have a tendency to cave in on you. So if you, you can imagine drilling a really, really deep hole in sort of sandy soil, what they found is if they would if they would pump a mixture of water and dirt, they would mix mud in, and they would pump that down the hole as they drilled, um, what that would do is it would go down, uh, the mud and the, the, the wet mixture would go down, and as the drill drilled further and chewed up that ground, that mud would go down, it would keep the sides from collapsing, and it would force all of the dirt and rock and everything that had been chewed up by the drill bit, it would force that to come back up out of the hole. So the use of mud at spindle top, if they hadn't discovered they could use mud, they might not have ever gotten the, the, the oil out of the holes. Uh, also, a rotary drill bit was uh, invented by a man named Howard Hughes Sr. Now, if you've ever used a drill at home, you know what a drill bit looks like. Um, that is not a good type of drill to use for oil. Uh, what they need is something that will go down and will chew it up. And the rotary drill bit, which is a, a picture over on the left that you see, actually has three heads that all turn uh, and sort of mesh together as they turn like gears. And uh, they can just they can literally just chew through the rock. Uh, and eventually they learn to actually uh, make drill bits where the heads uh, had uh, diamond heads, diamond bits, because we know diamonds are the, the hardest material uh, there is, and a diamond-tipped drill bit will uh, will cut through almost anything. Uh, it was the the rotary drill bit was the first drill bit that would drill through hard rock. So, aside from just the discovery of oil and the petroleum itself, so many other oil-related industries and businesses grew from that. Uh, there were oil field servicing companies, uh, companies that provided pipelines, companies that provided storage tanks and drilling rigs. All of these things were needed and, uh, and, and, and they, they needed these things to be built and to keep the oil industry running. The, the pumping of the oil out of the ground, a lot of money comes from that. But the oil field industry, the servicing industry is massive. Uh, probably one of the biggest companies in the world, literally one of the biggest companies in the world is Halliburton uh, Oil. And, and Halliburton doesn't even drill oil. All Halliburton does is provide all of the materials needed to drill oil. Uh, and the, the motto of Halliburton is the sun never sets on Halliburton because it is a company that is so large, it is in every country in the world. Uh, and they're, they're, they provide tools, uh, pipes, uh, services, everything that they need. Refineries are also a major part of the industry because if without refineries, we could not clean and process the oil so that it can be used. Now, the economic impact of oil. Uh, because of the easy access to oil, the United States started relying less on coal for energy and started relying more on petroleum. Uh, the economic impact of, of the oil industry led Texas from being this agricultural society where most people uh, grew crops for a living and it turned it into an industrial society where most people started moving to cities and working in businesses that related to the manufacturing of goods and factories and things like that. It also created something uh, called free enterprise which we've talked about supply and demand uh, when we talked about the cattle industry. Free enterprise means that people are, can go and they can, they can work in any business they want. Uh, you can get as rich as you want. If you, can, if you find a business where supply, is, 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 is supply and demand are, are, are in great effect. Whoops. And in 1905, the state of Texas realized that so much oil was being produced that they needed to get a, a little bit of that business, and uh, oil production tax began. So every gallon of oil that was pumped out of the ground um, and every bit of money that was made from the production of that oil uh, was taxed, and that helped provide the state of Texas with a lot of its, uh, a lot of its income. Now, because of the production of oil, uh, we started seeing a lot of uh, 
a lot of uh, uh, the impact of the oil industry had a negative effect on the environment. And because of that, the government decided that they needed to pass laws to prevent pollution and to improve the safety of people who worked in the oil industry. Uh, these gushers, these oil wells, when they would discover oil and it would be shooting this oil straight up in the air, um, they couldn't just, they, it wasn't an on and off switch. They could not just stop it. Uh, they had to, once the oil was pumping, they had to attach a wellhead to it, and then they had to, uh, to turn that wellhead off to keep the oil from just spraying everywhere. And this could take, this could take uh, anywhere from a day to a week to get a gusher under control. And you can imagine the millions of gallons of oil that just soaked into the ground and, and just ruined entire areas. Fires were also common because of natural gas that comes out of a uh, out of a well before the oil does, uh, because of the petroleum itself uh, being flammable, because of the, the re oil fires at refineries and things like that. So it was very dangerous, very detrimental to the environment, and the government realized they needed to pass laws to make this a safer and a cleaner industry. Uh, Unfortunately, most early attempts at regulation failed, but as time went on, they were able to, um, to come about with ways to, to make it more effective. Now, the social impact of oil, the biggest impact was urbanization. Uh, you had boom towns, these towns that overnight would just crop up. You had the internal combustion engine, uh, which every car uh, that's not a Tesla, uh, every normal... Uh, Engine, car with a gasoline engine, that's an internal combustion engine. And because of the internal combustion engine, it made farm equipment better. And because farm equipment became better, there were fewer farming jobs available. You know, instead of needing 50 men to go out and work a field, a farmer could have one large tractor and with the right number of attachments, the right attachments to go on the back of it, they could do many jobs on the farm that at one time required a lot of, of hands. Um, so when these men who had been working in, on farms for years realized, oh my gosh, they don't need me at the farm anymore. I've got to find a place that I can work. They would move to places where there were factories and they would begin working in jobs like that. Industrialization in the cities meant a need for more workers. So as the cities, as factories and things grew in cities, uh, they would, um, more and more people would move them. In 1900, most Texans lived in rural areas. 100 years later, most Texans live in urban areas. So in just 100 years, Texas went from about 10% of the people in Texas living in cities to about 90% of the people in Texas living in cities. So you can kind of see here what I was just telling you. Uh, in 1900, about 90% of the Texas population lived in the country, and only about 10% lived in cities. By the year 2000, 21 years ago, it had flip-flopped. 90% of the people in Texas live in what are called urban, or what are considered urban areas, where only 10% live out in the country. Now, uh, we talked about boom or bust. Boom or bust is a period of high prices in an industry. It's usually followed by ruinously low prices, which means very low prices, and bankruptcies. And as you can kind of see, looking at this chart, this kind of gives you an idea of the years that there was a boom in these industries. So the cattle industry that we talked about, from about the end of the Civil War, about 1865, to the mid-1880s, the cattle industry was huge because... Um, they had these cattle drives. We talked about cotton from the early 1800s when Texans people started first moving to Texas and growing cotton all the way through the 1940s. But then you see down here with the oil industry in 1900 the, or 1901, the oil industry started in Texas and it has just continued on through the years. So our summary. The discovery of oil at Spindletop led to laws being passed to control the oil industry. That's the political effect. Oil became the biggest industry in Texas. That's the economic effect. 
and people began moving from the country to big cities. So that would be our social effect. So that's about it. This has been a long video because this, there's a lot to talk about about the oil industry. Um, I hope you learned something, and until next time, we'll talk to you later.